genuine freedom for the here and now in this world and for eternity to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're going to spend a little more time in prayer, and I've invited us over the last five weeks to spend time in prayer and fasting during the course of the week for specific purposes, you know, for specific uh, prayer focuses, and we're going to add to that today. Uh, we started off with uh, praying about our, our associate pastor, and we've been continuing to pray in that. I invite you to do so with me, uh, because this is kind of a big deal uh, for our church, that we will find an associate pastor, a full-time uh, pastor to help us in the ministry. And I don't know if you have noticed, uh, for those of you that have been around here for a while, this church is... is uh, Something's going on, uh, and, and in a good way, and I'm really excited. I, I hope you are, too, and so we, we're hoping that uh, when we find the right man to fill that role, that uh, even God's going to do even more things, so we're excited about that. Uh, we've been praying for the salvation of our loved ones, and uh, we're going to continue to do that as long as we have breath in our lungs, amen, uh, and uh, then there's going to be, we've been praying for those that are uh, dealing with cancer, and there are uh, always people in the fellowship that are dealing with cancer and other long-term illnesses, uh, those that are experiencing loss, and that just seems to continue. Uh, we were blessed that uh, Sue Nespor was with us this morning, uh, and along with um, uh, Deb uh, Brower, uh, the two latest on that list, but of course there are many that are dealing with uh, the loss of loved ones and loss in other forms. So, you know, that comes in a lot of different ways. Sometimes emotionally, sometimes it can be the loss of a job or a relationship or what have you. Uh, and th this week, we're going to add to that list the uh, return of prodigals. And if you're not quite sure what that means, uh, we're going to pray that uh, those people that have been part of the church, the body of Christ, that have wandered away or wandered away from the Lord, that they would come back. And so... Um, and I'm, and I'm not talking about just our church, right? But come back to the Lord and be connected with the body of Christ. That's an important thing. So uh, we're going to add that to our list. And so I know it's a little complicated, but uh, as you're pray praying and fasting during the week, I would invite you to remember all of those things in your prayer. We'll start off like we always do with a time of silent prayer and, and whatever burden might be on your heart, we suggest that you bring that to the Lord. You're welcome to come to the prayer rail if you would like, if you want somebody to pray with you. Feel free to give me a wave, or, or you're, if you're with somebody that you know needs prayer, you can invite them to come with you, and uh, we'll spend time in silent prayer that way. I'm going to lead us in a prayer of all that stuff that I just listed, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer, like we always do. We'll put the words on the screen in back of me and on your screen at home, and I invite you to join praying the Lord's Prayer out loud so that you can hear the sound of your own voice. Let's pray together. Lord our God, you are a God that does unimaginable things amidst your creation. And so we come before you this morning, Lord, with, with heaviness in our hearts in a lot of cases. There's difficulty and pain and sorrow that people are going through. Dealing with illnesses. Lord, we, we, we pray believing that you are going to allow us to discern by the power of God the Holy Spirit in us and in him who our associate pastor ought to be because we believe that you've appointed a specific man for this position. We pray too, Lord, that uh, as we uh, deal with the losses, Lord, we pray that the hand of God would bring comfort supernaturally to those that are experiencing grief, pain and sorrow and God this morning we pray too for the return of prodigals that have walked away 
from the truth of your word and from the body of Christ. And we reflect back on the, the, our understanding, the way Jesus taught us what it means to be a prodigal, that, that you are always ready to receive them back. And we pray, Lord, for our, the church, this and others, to, be, to receive prodigals back well and graciously as, as well. And so, Lord, for our loved ones, our, uh, our children, spiritually and biologically, Lord, we, we pray that you would bring them back so that they would be reconnected with the body of Christ in a way that allows them to grow as disciples faithfully and according to your word. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're continuing our series uh, in the book of James. And just so you know, we've got one more week in James, and then we get to Palm Sunday. Can you believe it? Uh, so we're going to take a little bit of time off from the book of James for Palm Sunday and for Easter Sunday, and then we'll come back and finish that up, and then we've got some other stuff planned. Uh, I do actually plan this stuff. I know sometimes it may not seem like that, but uh, we've we're got uh, another couple of series uh, right on the heels of this one. But today, we're going to finish the fourth chapter of James's letter. And so we are in James chapter 4, verses 11 through 17. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who, does, who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. And so our big idea for today is that the authority of God and, the, and our dependence on Him calls us to action in following His will for our lives. And I know that is a run-on sentence, uh, but hopefully we'll understand it when we get to the end, by, maybe even before, amen? Before, but by the time we get to the end of the message, we'll understand what we're talking about this morning. And so this is, I, 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 I heard a lot of people say, like, yeah, this whole James thing, because I mentioned it last week. I think it was last week. I can't really remember. But if I mentioned it recently, like, every time I read James, it just feels like he's, like, hammering me with something, doesn't it? And, and I thought, you know, people are probably tired of me hammering him with something. But <laughs> don't blame me, because this is what James says, right? And so I, uh, as we take a look at this, I want us to consider where Scripture actually comes from. Right, it's because I take what's called a high view of Scripture, meaning that as as we see in Second Timothy uh, three seven sixteen, excuse me, it says all Scripture is God breathed or inspired by God or given to us by God, and so I understand that the Bible, the, actually the source of the Bible, is not James or John or Peter or any of the other pe people that have their names on a book or a letter or what have you, but it's God the Holy Spirit. And so if I have a beef against something that the Bible teaches me, then it's not against the writer who we attribute it to. It's actually the ultimate author who is God. And so, uh, like I tell people, you can argue with Paul, you can argue with John, you can argue with any of these guys if you want. You probably won't really win that argument, but you're certainly not going to win the argument with God. So 
uh, as we look at this, I, I think there's some really important stuff. And, and, and if you've noticed, James is, is written, you could almost like dissect a lot of the, what he talks about. It's written almost like the way that the Proverbs are. It's kind of like this, then this, then this. And, and, and you could bullet point the whole thing, which I love to do. Amen? Because I, I think bullet points, I preach bullet points, and they're only second to graphs in my, in my mind. So, what we're, But we're going to see some bullet points as we go through it and kind of break it down into little pieces. That's what we're trying to do. And there's three points in your outline, because that's good preaching, amen? You've got to have three points in your outline. But the first one is, is, is that pure speech doesn't condemn. And you, you may remember how uh, a few weeks ago we talked about James is pointing to the tongue and the language that we use and, and that kind of thing. And so he's kind of identified or helped us understand what pure speech genuinely is. And so continuing on that theme, just a little bit as we get to this section, he says, do not speak against one another, brethren. He was, and remember, the word brethren is, is, is the church. He's, he's referring to other Christians. Hey, you guys, don't be saying stuff about each other. Because he says, one who speaks against his brother, and see how that fits with brethren, who, somebody who speaks against somebody else that's in the church, he says, judges or judges his brother, speaks against the law and judges the law. So we're not supposed to go around. We talked about gossiping a couple of weeks ago. But it, it, he kind of is, is reminding us we got to be careful about our criticism of other people. In fact, back in, in Leviticus chapter 19, God's law is, bring, is, uh, is coming to Moses. You remember all the, the laws, the Ten Commandments, for example. But one of the things that it, God says to, to Moses is, you shall not go about as a slanderer among your people. And then he doesn't just say, hey, here's kind of a, a, a rule. But he says, hey, I am the Lord. Hey, don't forget who told you this. Don't go around slandering other people. And when he, when he says that, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. That's a little bit complicated to, to read in, in the New American Standard Bible. But he says, uh, how, how do you judge the law? Essentially, what he, what, the way that I understand that is he's saying, hey, you can say like the, the law is not good anymore. Or uh, you remember the Bible tells us a couple of times, woe to him who calls evil good and good evil, right? That, and so we decide what we, we want to criticize God's law. And that's why I point out that view of Scripture, like a high view of Scripture or what's called a low view of Scripture. Because criticizing the law can take a lot of different forms. And, and one of the most common forms of criticizing God's law is trying to explain away or diminish what it is that God's told us. Because, you know, culturally, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, that, that's from uh, thousands of years ago. That doesn't apply to us anymore. You know, we've, we've evolved. We've changed a lot. Our sensitivities are a lot different than they were thousands of years ago when the Bible was written. And so that doesn't really apply to us anymore. In fact, even if, Pastor, you know, if you, if you were to say some of that stuff, that's considered hate speech culturally. Really what that's doing is judging the law of God. We're saying that, you know what, I know better than what God knows. And you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the fall. And, and I mentioned this last week where essentially what Satan said to Eve was, like, did God really say that? Come on. And so... And they ate of, a, of a one particular tree in the garden. And it's not, it wasn't the tree of life that they ate from. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sometimes people say, like, yeah, see, that's why God doesn't want you to know what's good and evil. No, that's not the case. Because clearly he's told us what's good and evil in his eyes. What he doesn't want us to do is to think that we can determine what is good and evil. And that's why God said, you don't eat of that tree. That's my tree. And so when I, when I read this in Leviticus, he says, I am the Lord. Hey, don't forget the source of truth. It's not up to us to determine that. And so there's a lot of people that want to do away with Scripture. You know, you remember a couple years ago, they're taking the Ten Commandments off of courthouses and all that kind of stuff. And just, hey, we don't, we don't want to hear from some other authority. This might be a little bit of an extreme example, but I, I, 
heard somebody talking a little bit uh, ago, just this past week, about the Nuremberg Trials. And for those of you that are not history buffs, the Nuremberg Trials were trials of uh, Nazi uh, soldiers after World War II, after the, the, the end of World War II, of a lot of uh, prison guards that had overseen and participated in the atrocities that happened in some, con- some of the concentration camps were put on trial. And so the, their, their defense attorney stood up in front of the court and said, hey, you can't judge them because they had a different set of, of laws in Germany at the time. And so you guys try to bring in laws from someplace else and apply them here. You, you don't have the authority to do that. And so technically, nothing that they had done was illegal at the time. Nothing that Hitler did was illegal. He didn't break a single law in Germany because he changed the laws to satisfy what he wanted to do. But then the American attorney stood up. And he he said, you know, in our country, we, we may have different laws than what you have, but there is a set of laws that supersedes all of them. And what you have done is violate the law of the Most High God. And so culturally now we're saying, like, hey, we've got different, I, 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 don't, I don't believe what you believe. But I still believe the source of the law ultimately is God. And so when we oppose what God has said, we put ourselves in the position of judging God's law. And that's what James is reminding us of. That's not a position we ought to be in. And so in, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, hey, we're back in the Sermon on the Mount. Could you believe that? We're going to go there a few more times during the course of the day. Every time we read James, I just keep seeing the Sermon on the Mount again and again and again. But culturally, we're saying, hey, you're not supposed to judge anybody. Who are you to judge me? Whatever you want goes. And you do you, I do me, and, and we're not supposed to judge one another. In fact, I saw another video this past week. At a, it was at a, a pride parade, and, and it was a pastor there that was just preaching God's word. And he wasn't confronting anybody. He wasn't getting in anybody's face, but he's just bringing God's word forth. And this lady came running up to him and said, doesn't the Bible say that you're not supposed to judge others? And he said, no. And she didn't know what to say after that. That was the one bullet she had in her gun, I guess. So anyway, so what, what we see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, this is Jesus speaking. He says, don't judge so that you will not be judged. And that, that's what she knew, that part. But she stopped there. Because what Jesus actually said was, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And so you want to be a little careful about how you judge other people, but you're supposed to, like, we're supposed to direct people according to God's Word. We're allowed to, to do that. In fact, right after this is when Jesus talks about that whole, be careful about the, looking at the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye or a log in your own eye. Right? And so we've got to be careful about it. He says it's, 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 there's a way in which we're supposed to judge. And we're not supposed to be hypocrites when we do so. Because that really is, is the message of that passage. But did you know that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this is what uh, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, the 1 Corinthians 5.12, it says, For you ha- what have I to do, he's saying, about judging outsiders, referring to the church, so people that are outside the church. And like I told you a couple weeks ago, sinners are supposed to sin. Why would we be surprised that a sinner sins? But it's supposed to be a little bit different inside the church. But for those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked from among yourselves. And he's saying, so you're supposed to. In fact, in the New Living Translation, it actually says you're obligated to judge people that are in the church. And that doesn't, that's not a a finger-wagging condemnation. That's a, hey, you know, I, I see something going on in your life. It, it, it seems like maybe we've gotten off track just a little bit. You know, it, it, and so that's, that's one of the accountabilities that we have in the context of the body of Christ. But that's something that people don't really like very much because you can go to a lot of different churches where they say, hey, whatever you want to do, it's all good. 
But woe to him who calls evil good and good evil. In fact, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it actually says a spiritual man judges all things. And so when we observe something culturally, when, when we observe something on social media, we observe something in the entertainment world or in, in politics or what have you, as, a, as indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, each one of us is allowed to judge that. And so judgment doesn't mean that I get to condemn them. That is not my authority. God is the only one, as we see in the, in the Scripture, that ultimately will bring that judgment. But I can discern that and say, hey, no, that's not okay. without being a hypocrite. And so it says uh, in verse 12, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. And so that's the one that we are to fear. That's what the Bible tells us, to fear God, to fear the one that is able to, uh, to both save and destroy. And it says, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And so in verse 13, we, we continue and, it's, and we're going to see that Tomorrow is uncertain. I, th I think we can agree on that. It says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. And so he's not really condemning doing business, and he's not really condemning uh, f uh, forecasting stuff. But a lot of commentators suggest that James probably had a beef against some of the traders at the time because there's a lot in Scripture that talks about fair trade, right, and, and, uh, and equal balances and, and all that kind of stuff. We're supposed to deal fairly with other people, and so he would have probably had a negative attitude towards some of the traders that were being dishonest at the time, and, and I certainly share that sentiment today. There's a lot of people that do dishonest business, and so but what he's really talking about is, hey, you, you're making plans for tomorrow, but not including God in the process. Um, you got to pray for the people that had to listen to me for however many hours it was at the membership retreat yesterday, because some of you are like, yeah, I know, I remember that, right? Um, and, well, a lot of times my voice barely makes it through the second service the day after that. Um, But we talked about a lot of stuff at the membership retreat. And one, one of the things that we talk about is that we don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow. I think we can agree on that. I get surprised all the time. Anybody else? But I spent 20-something years as a project director and project manager in the pharmaceutical industry, and I had to do, this is what I talked about yesterday with those guys, I used to do timelines for uh, development projects that were like 10 years long. And people would get all worried about Gantt charts and stuff. You remember Gantt charts? And so I would, but I would do this, this forecast, and oh, if it's, a, if it's a $350 million a year product, every single day costs a million dollars. So you, we got we to gotta get it done. And I'm looking at 8, 10, 12 years into the future. And, they, and somebody literally would look at the stupid timeline, and I thought it was stupid, and it was my timeline, but they would, they would say, like, oh, if, well, it, this says it's going to happen on a Monday. If we could make it happen the Friday before that, that would be even better. I'm going, well, that's like six years from now. Are you really worried about that? Who knows what's going to happen six years from now? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because I'll tell you, I, I, almost every week there's a couple of days when I think, man, okay, here's what's going to happen. I got my schedule written out. And I got my, my little to-do list, you know, on my desk and all that. And you some of you guys know what I'm talking about. And, I, and, I, and the phone rings, and it all goes right out the window. But God knows. And so when we make timelines and, and we don't include God, and we don't say, hey, you know what, God? It's all in your hands, ultimately. Then, uh, then that's what he's talking about because you know it says in proverbs chapter 27 there's a lot of wisdom in proverbs that's what it's based on it says do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring and forth and we, we, we yeah we got no idea we have some we have some anticipation but i find myself being really inaccurate more and more in that regard but one of the things people talk about all the time is is when's jesus going to come back again 
Have you noticed that? Um, what? I thought maybe that was it. I wasn't. <laughs> We're all still here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, if we're still here, is anybody missing? Okay. I saw that movie. I don't want to. Um, yeah. Jesus told uh, a parable, you know, the, the way that he taught uh, about in, a, in relationship to when he was going to come back. But people ask me all the time, like, wh- when's Jesus coming back, Pastor? You studied the Bible. Like, when, when's Jesus coming back? And it, I, I don't have the faintest idea, because he said he didn't even know when he was coming back. He says, only the Father knows when I'm coming back. And so I, I'm pretty good with it. If Jesus doesn't know, then I don't feel like I need to. But one of the things that he told us was we ought to be ready, because he told a parable about how uh, a vineyard owner left uh, the master uh, had a bunch of slaves uh, or indentured servants, and so he left them in charge, and he went away for a while. You remember that story? And so we'll pop that up. And in Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 47, he said that the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. Because in our text from this morning... It says, rather than you guys try to not try to include God in it, maybe you want to say, if it's God's will, then this is what we'll do. Hey, we have some anticipation, but what Jesus is saying, hey, you ought to actually prepare for what God's going to call you to say. They, 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 they didn't get ready or act in accord with God's will. And so sometimes, you know what we do in church? We, we try to figure out what's God's will, don't we? You ever try and figure out what God's will is? I try and figure out what God's will is. And so we, we, we kind of sit in one spot and we say, Lord, tell me your will for my life. And God usually says something a little bit different. In fact, it, it, it's a little bit like us, like if you were to leave here and get in your car and sit in the parking lot and turn the wheel like this, it, your car's not going to make any turns. Right, but we, we kind of act like that with God sometimes. We just go like this with God. And maybe you make the little boom sound. You know what I mean? And so, like, like we're like a three year old, you put them behind the wheel and they get all excited about it. But sometimes we treat God that way. Hey, I, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to make the sound like I'm going someplace, but I'm not actually going anywhere. Because go back to what Abraham went through. When God said, hey, you, get up and start walking. And, of course, Abraham asked very reasonable questions. He was a pretty smart guy. It's like, hey, so where are we going? And God says, don't worry about it. I'll tell you when you get there. But you've got to get up and start walking. The only way you can steer a car is it has to be moving. And then when you turn the wheel, your input actually changes the direction just a little bit. And so we can't sit in one place. We actually, and so the, the prayer ought not to be, Lord, how can I understand your will? How can I know your will? The better prayer would be, how can I do your will? Because you remember, Jesus said, not my will, but your will be understood, comprehended, done. And so, how, how in the world are we going to understand what God's got for us? Now, I, I want to share with you a verse that got me in some trouble just a little while ago, and you guys have heard a little bit about this story, but uh, I was talking to a, a, a lady pastor from a church right up the road from us and, uh, and on the street, and, and she told me she's a universalist. She says, everybody goes to heaven. And I used this verse, uh, again from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wait, w- w- Huh? But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Who does God's will. And, and this is when Jesus is talking about, remember there's, there's two paths? 
You know, which one are you going to take? You're going to take the, the narrow way that leads to life. You're going to take the wide way that leads to destruction. And right after this, he says, um, some people are going to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. But the one who does the will of God will understand from him, well done, good and faithful servant. Not well understood, well comprehended, well studied, good and faithful servant. Well done. Now, some of you probably think I'm preaching legalism this morning because oh, you keep saying, I've got to do something to earn God's favor. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. And we looked at, at good works. And, but you remember what James talked about a couple of weeks ago, right? Faith without works is dead, being by itself. He said, how can that kind of faith? And he's not pointing to the works. He's pointing to the faith. He's saying, how can that kind of faith save somebody? But how can I possibly know? You, you know? you know how we know? We read God's Word. Can you imagine that? You read the Bible. Cause it says stuff in the Bible, like it, that it's God's will that, that uh, we give thanks for everything. Right? It, it says in the Bible that we're supposed to abstain from sexual immorality. Go figure that. That's co not culturally popular, is it? It says in the Bible that we're supposed to uh, do right things to silence foolish people. It says that we're supposed to, uh, it's God's will that all men would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so what we can do to do God's will is to share the gospel with people so that they can turn from their sin and turn to Jesus to be saved. And if there is somebody here this morning that is not saved, it is God's will for you. If you want to stand before the Lord and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant, you did my will, that means to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. And say, I can't do this on my own. He's the one that's the judge. I'm not your judge. Let today be the day of salvation, is what the Bible says. So I know for certain that there are people that can hear me this morning that need to put their trust in Jesus Christ, to turn from their sins and turn to Him and ask for forgiveness. It's not a complicated formula. It's not that there's some magical prayer that you have to say that or, or a spell that you're going to put on somebody or if I have to uh, perform certain rituals. There's none of that stuff. It's just a matter of saying, okay, Lord, I need you. And I want you to be my Savior. I want to receive you as Savior. And I want to follow you as my Lord. That's the two aspects of Jesus. He's Lord and Savior. Savior means that he's the one that died on the cross to take the punishment that we deserved and that through faith in him we could be reconciled to God and, and live eternity in heaven. And when we say Lord, that means he's the boss. And remember, he's referred to in the Bible as the Word incarnate, God's holy Word incarnate. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That's Jesus. And so when I tell you that if I follow God's word, that I'm, that I'm following God's will, I'm, I'm telling you that I'm following Jesus through the writings of Scripture. And so as, as a church, I told you, we, we've been uh, doing something for the last five weeks. Some of you haven't even been here five weeks, so that's okay. But I, I want to turn now to Acts chapter 13 for, uh, for just a moment. And so Acts chapter 13, we looked at this when we did that whole series on Paul's mission trips, because this is essentially the beginning of Paul's first mission trip, and he's being sent out by the church. And so we're at the beginning of Acts chapter 13, we see something that the church does to determine God's will. They do it collectively to determine God's will. It says, and now there were at Antioch in the church that, that was there, prophets and teachers, and so there's, there's roles in the church, even in the early church, and it names these guys, Barnabas and Simeon, who was also called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, who was, had been brought up with Herod, the, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And you're thinking like, oh man, I can't understand all these names. This is, this is crazy. Okay, there's a bunch of guys there. If their names were Steve and Jim and Harold, I mean, it would be the same. But look what the church does. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. 
And that's what I've invited us to do for the last five weeks. Ministering to the Lord. They're coming, they're worshiping and they're praying. They're coming to God. And they're fasting at the same time. The Holy Spirit said. Did, did you catch that? The Holy Spirit said something. They're praying and they're fasting and they're, and they're coming to God and they hear the Holy Spirit say something. And so sometimes we can actually hear the Holy Spirit, but other times it just, it just convicts us. He convicts us in our, in our hearts. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And in verse 4 it says, For being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia. And so God the Holy Spirit moves in the midst of prayer, prayer and fasting. And so they determine God's will, even for individual people. And so when I ask you to join me in praying and fasting, that God would make it evident to us who our associate pastor is supposed to be. And this is a huge deal for our church. When I invite you in to do, do that, we're not, we're not just making stuff up. I'm not just saying, hey, you've got to skip lunch. You know, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is actually seeking God's will. And we see the model for that in the words of God in our Bible. And in case we're wondering, that's the same Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter 13 from 2,000 years ago that is indwelling those of us who are believers in Christ. And so during the worship set, when you feel something going on in the sanctuary, and I know you do because I feel it, that's God the Holy Spirit working in you. Oh man, this is, this is good, right? You get a, the, the hairs on your arms start to stand up a little bit when, when God the Holy Spirit's doing something. And so that's why I'm inviting you to participate in this. I, I, you know, it, it can't be just a handful of us. We all have to participate in this, just like the early church did. Join me in it. It might look a little bit different from you than it does for me. But this is a model that has been established for us in the words of Scripture. And so when we try to do God's will, we can't do God's will apart from a deep relationship with Him. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So what we're going to look at is the, the third point in our outline this morning. is Again, it, it's, it's kind of broken up. I, I want to read uh, verses uh, 16 and 17. He says, that as, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. And we, we talked about the sense of pride, and, and you know, all pride comes from a, a sense of, I'm sorry, all sin comes from a, a sense of pride, and so we ought not to be boasting and, and not be hypocrites and, and pointing to other people and, and condemning them. But look what it says in verse 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. The one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it. And so we just talked about how we know what the right thing to do is. But once we know the right thing, and then we don't do it, James is saying, well, you, you, you kind of got it, otherwise you're sinning. And so, you know, there's, there's two main categories of sin. There's, there's ser- sins of commission, the things that we do that we ought not to do. And then there's sins of omission, knowing what we ought to do and not doing it. And so I have a question for you. Have you ever driven by somebody on a rainy night that's, uh, by the roadside with a flat tire and not stop to help them? I have. Should I probably have stopped and helped them? Yeah. Would that be a right thing to do? I've actually been the one in the rain on the shoulder of the road fixing a, repla- replacing a flat tire, and it's not all that much fun. And I, 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 if somebody had stopped to help me, I might even say, oh, no, that's okay, I got it. I'm already soak, soaking wet. You ever get like, so wet that the stuff inside your wallet is soaked? That's how you know when you're really wet, amen? And so I, I've, I've been in that position. But there, there's a lot of things that we know we ought to do that we don't do. 
But Jesus tells us some pretty important stuff about knowing what we ought to do and not doing it. And so sometimes we kind of overlook it. So we're going to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Imagine that. And back in Matthew chapter 7 again, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, this is what Jesus tells to his mul- the, the multitudes at the Sermon on the Mount. And again, I, I, I'm more convinced than I've ever been that James is right there here in everything that he says. He says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock, who hears these words of mine and does a word study on them and says, man, I can say it in three languages and and no that's not what he says he hears these words of mine and acts on them and then right after that he says the one who hears these words of mine and does not act on them is like the one who is a is like a fool thank you Kurt and so who builds his house on sand it's not whoever hears these words and whoever doesn't hear these words you see how that it that that works it's the, the differentiating factor there is acting on them and not acting on them. It's really clear from Scripture. Because the storm's coming. And, and so think back to the context from this morning. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't, we don't have any idea. You know, I, I always look at the weather forecast, and the weather forecast is almost always wrong. Sometimes it's not that far off, but it's never 100% accurate. And the same is true of our anticipation of tomorrow. God knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. And one of the things that Tim Tebow always, always says is that, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. But whoever, whoever actually does something, and don't forget what the difference between somebody who does something and who, somebody who doesn't do something is, right? Somebody who does something does something. Okay, you guys should know that one by now. From Miles McPherson at the Rock Church in San Diego, the only difference between somebody who does something and somebody who doesn't do something is somebody who does something does something. It's not that they've, they've got a whole lot more resources that that, you know, it's more convenient for them or, or, you know, they're better equipped or they have a deeper understanding than I do or, or any of that kind of stuff. It's just a willingness to go do what we know we ought to get, do. And that's one of the things that God the Holy Spirit calls us into. You, you ever get that feeling once in a while? I, some of you probably do when I, when I do the announcements. I'm, I, and I, I'm not picking on anybody, but probably when I do the announcements at the beginning of the service and I tell you, hey, you know what, we need kids to help, we need people to help in kids' ministries, you know, uh, or, or uh, you know, we need you to help out with this, that, or the other thing, and, you, and you're like, oh, uh, and you just kind of, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I know you know what I mean. Uh, you're like, you're, you're kind of like white knuckle it for a couple of minutes, and then, oh, it passed. Whew. Or maybe somebody else will do it. Or maybe somebody else will step up. I mean, that's, I think that's what James is saying. Hey, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, that's not between me and you. That's between you and him. You know that phone call that you feel like you ought to make to somebody? Anybody have a phone call? You got a phone call. I know you do. Because everybody's got a phone call. Maybe it's a text message or it could even be an email. I don't know. But there's, there's somebody you're supposed to reach out to. And you keep thinking, oh, I ought to do that. I don't really want to. Well, I ought to do that. And you've been thinking it for like six months, maybe six years, right? And you're still thinking like, oh, I do that. That's God the Holy Spirit. And so if you don't do that, and God, and God the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, this is what I want you to do, and you're not doing it. In fact, in, in, in 1 John uh, 3, 17, John says, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? I know what I ought to do, but I don't do it. And don't forget what Jesus says. Whoever feeds somebody that's naked, whoever... Yeah, well, you could do that too, but you could... You, <laughs> Whoever feeds somebody that's hungry and clothes somebody that's naked and, and gives a cup of water to somebody that's thirsty or visits somebody in prison, any of that, you, you do it to me, was what Jesus says. And what 
Paul says, I made reference to this a couple times in this series, but in, in, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 19, this is what Paul says. For the good I want, I don't do it. But I practice the very evil I do not want. And so essentially Paul is saying, you know what, I, I know what I ought to do. I know what God's calling me to do. But I don't do it. And as James says, that's sin. That's hardening our heart. That's stiffening our necks against God the Holy Spirit. And early on in the book of Acts, that's one of the condemnations that comes against people that don't want to turn to Christ. He says, you keep resisting the Holy Spirit. And so I get it. You know, it, it sounds kind of like a downer. And if I, it sounds like I'm trying to make you feel bad about yourself. That's not my intention. But my intention is to explain what God's Word says. And I think that the sense of conviction that we feel, including myself, is from God the Holy Spirit. Because one of the primary roles that God the Holy Spirit plays in the life of a believer is to convict us of our sin. And so we know what we ought to do. And so when Jesus says, let your will be done, he's called us to perform in a way according to God's will here on the earth. And just like that parable they said that the slaves were in charge, he's referring to us the church, because he's not here right now. Remember, he, he left us in charge until he comes back again. It, 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 we can see how that parallel works. And so as the church, if we don't do what God has called us to do, then we are not fulfilling God's will for our lives or for the church. So I just want to come back to the big idea for a second and see if it makes any more sense than it did the first time around. But the authority of God because he is the one true judge. And he is sovereign over all things. And our dependence on him, apart from him, we can do nothing. Exactly. So he calls us into action in following his will for our lives. And so right out of Scripture is our now what statement for this week from Romans chapter 12, and you guys are familiar with this, and it says, and do not be conformed to this world. And so whatever the world says is acceptable may not be what God says is acceptable, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and so that we think differently through faith in Jesus Christ. And it says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, or a new creation. Old things have passed away and new things have come. And it says so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which, according to God's word, is good, and according to God's word is acceptable, and according to God's word is perfect. And so, Lord our God, we thank you for the, the privilege that we have to gather together in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we submit to the Lordship of Christ in our lives, we pray that you would confirm in our spirits what it is you've got for us to do. That we would not just understand the will of God in our lives, not just